Welcome to the Big Picture Show with your host, Josh Tickell. Great. We are the new media, so don't forget to like and share this podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode four of the Big Picture Show, broadcasting live from the teeming metropolis of Ojai, California, where we have all of 8,000 residents here in this small mountain village. We are a small community. Some people call this an intentional community surrounded by, well, I won't say what they call it, surrounded by other types of cities. Anyway, it's been a, it's been a quiet week here in Ojai. The temperature is changing, finally. The leaves are starting to fall. And my wife did an incredible post on Facebook about our lawn. Now, most people think about lawns. They think about this green area where you have to water and put a tremendous amount of chemicals into your lawn. In fact, lawns, it turns out, are the most heavily irrigated crop in America. They're also the most chemically sprayed crop in America, but not our lawn. You see, our lawn is a, get this, multi-species cover crop. Meaning, when we moved in, our lawn was falling apart. It was desertifying. It was literally turning brown. My wife, Rebecca, who many of you know, she will be on next week with a field report. She said, I want a green lawn. She grew up in Vermont. Everything's green. I said, honey, we live in California. Nothing's green in California. Not really. Not if you don't irrigate it. So we had this protracted discussion. And what came out of it? The idea to plant 16 different species in our backyard, including clover and green fescue, things that we found were native or near native to this area. We planted all of those. We put 50,000 worms, five zero fifty thousand worms into our lawn. Guess where we got them? You won't believe it. Amazon.com. Yes, I clicked. I ordered worms. They showed up in boxes. We put them into the lawn. And then we waited, and we prayed, and we hoped, and what happened? It grew back. But what's interesting about our lawn, here we are in fall, it is a patchwork of different species. Sometimes there's more clover, sometimes there's more fescue, sometimes there's the old sod turf, which was here when we moved in. And man, if people aren't interested in regenerating their lawns, I tell you what, we got so much response from that post, we are going to do a whole show... I promise you, listeners out there on iTunes and Facebook, we'll do a whole show on how to regenerate your lawn using multi-species cover crops. And we're going we're gonna to switch to our guest soon, Connor Jones. Connor Jones is going to talk a little bit about permaculture. What if your lawn wasn't something you had to continuously add chemicals to and water? but it was part of permanent agriculture. Can't wait to hear from Connor in just a minute. A couple of little bits of news before then. Last week's show came to you from Elk City, Oklahoma, the middle of the United States, what was once considered the Dust Bowl. Now, what was amazing is when we went on the farm fields in Elk City, we saw so much desertified brown dirt, not covered by anything. So it's been 80 years and there was a dust storm that came in the day that we left. The wind was blowing, and the dirt was blowing away. Yes, a whole ton of topsoil per acre. Do you know how thick a ton of topsoil is in an acre? It is as thick as one piece of paper. So they literally lost tons and tons of topsoil in Oklahoma the day we left. Don't forget to ask questions on Facebook as we go through this episode. We are live today on Facebook. Got great guests. Make sure to ask your great questions. Can't wait to hear them. And we have two important guests, the first of which is going to tell us about permaculture. The second one is going to tell us about permaculture in the ocean. You don't want to miss this. couple of pieces of news. Those of you loyal listeners who have been watching or listening since episode one, remember John Rulak from New Tiva, our first guest. John has a new blog post out this week. Very powerful. He says, Oxford study attacks regenerative agriculture. Monsanto ally? Implying, is Oxford an ally of the biotech company Monsanto? And he talks a little bit about, in this blog, the fact that Monsanto, according to John, 
the Monsanto connection to Oxford University, and I quote, it seems that Monsanto has deep and enduring connection to the University of Oxford. Monsanto has paid out to UO, University of Oxford, through various business ventures, more than 50 million dollars. Oh, sorry, 50 million pounds. That's 75 million dollars. Now, all of this was around a report that a think tank that Oxford co-sponsors called Grazed and Confused. And that think tank put out this report that says that grazing cows is extremely deleterious to the environment. And we shouldn't do that. No way, no how. But we shouldn't keep them in refinery, in, in closed, confined areas either. So it, this report is very much against regenerative agriculture. It's against bringing cows back out into the pasture. And John postulates that it's because these people are in the pockets of a very big company that would prefer to see us do monocropped agriculture with a lot of chemicals, not be independent, not be able to grow our own food. Connor's going to talk about growing our own food in a minute. But to conclude, John says, during the entire 127-page report, the terms soil health, soil ecosystem, soil microbes, and topsoil loss aren't mentioned at all. They failed to mention the vast amounts of synthetic nitrogen from fracked methane belching wells applied to grow the GMO corn for the cows. So, in essence, grazed and confused, John says, should be called dazed and confused. More news from the New York Times today. Not good, not good. Crops in 25 states damaged by unintended drift of weed killer. It says the weed killer called dicamba, this stuff that is used in mostly soybeans, is spreading to places it shouldn't be spreading and killing crops. 3.6 million acres of soybean crops have been damaged. And according to a representative from the Environmental Protection Agency, he says, and I quote, it is not often that we hear about impacts of this magnitude. That's from the director of the EPA's pesticide program. It's not often that we hear about them, perhaps because we're not studying the pesticides that we use that are commonly found in our food, among them 2,4-D and glyphosate. We cover those in the Kiss the Ground book. Now, jellyfish are thriving as warming seas, acidification, and deoxygenation threaten other marine life. After long ignoring the beautiful but mysterious creatures, scientists are trying to figure out what makes them such survivors in the age of climate change. We're going to talk a little bit more about the oceans, how the oceans are changing, and how we can sustain them. After all, oceans are responsible for over 50% of our oxygen. So we're going to switch now to our first guest, permaculture expert, Gardener, farmer, uh, dad, uh, just all around amazing guy. Now, I want to introduce everybody to Connor Jones. Connor, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us this week. Mm, thank you, Josh. It's good to be here. Awesome. Now, move your chair up for me just a little bit. Speak into that microphone mm-hmm. nice and clear. Now, Connor, you're involved in permaculture, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, good. So, we want to sort of start to give our audience a basic understanding. Sure. And and we'll build from there. Yeah. What is permaculture? Yeah. Permaculture is a design system that incorporates ethics. And and it uses those ethics to make decisions that are also informed through observation of natural systems. So there's many design methodologies that humans have created, and very few of them incorporate ethics. So... (laughs) That's kind of a foundation. No, no, no. Are you saying that our government doesn't include ethics? (laughs) Well, I mean, it depends on how you define ethics. Uh, Good point. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, and ultimately it attempts to create systems that that model nature that are economically viable and ecologically um, in alignment. They take care of or improve the environment where they are implemented. Okay, so we're looking, I mean, to break it down. Yeah. We have a, an ethic. Now, how do, you, how do you delineate ethics from morals? 
Because, I, I, you know, some people say, well, that's a bad plant. It's a weed yeah. or that's a bad animal. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people think cows are just bad. Right. I would hate to be a cow. <laughs> There's a lot of cow prejudice in the world right now. Yeah, that's true. It's yeah. true. Well, I think it's in the context of permaculture, it's really simple because there are already three ethics that are identified as being the three ethics of permaculture. And so that's care of earth, care of people, and setting limits to population and consumption, which is often shortened to fair share. Okay. Care of earth. Yeah. Care of people. And fair share. And fair share, which is setting reasonable... Now, what kind of crazy talk is this? <laughs> you want to exactly. care for the planet and care for people? I can't, I can't buy into this at all. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so actually, I'm totally for it. Sure. These are, the, these are the principles. And then what do you do from there? Is this a gardening system? Is this a system of growing food? Could this be something larger? Yeah, it's, I mean, given that it is a system of design that uses natural patterns, it can be applied to many different aspects of, um, of human life and, and the way that we provide our resources. So ultimately, it is designing our resource supply chain with ethics and using the model of, of ecology. So this could be um, you know, food, fuel, medicine, shel fiber, shelter, all these things mm. can fall under the context of permaculture or be designed using permaculture as the lens for how to look at the design, if that makes sense. It does. I, yeah. I mean, it does to me. Sure. Hopefully it does to our, yeah. our listeners, our viewers as well. Hopefully we'll get some, some great questions chiming in in a, in a, in a second. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting to me personally about permaculture mm is that, uh, just adjusting the Facebook thing here, sure. is that we've got a, an overarching set of principles. Mm. And from, that, from those principles, you're going to design a way for human beings to get their needs met. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and in essence, what I often liken it to is um, the experience of any species in an ecosystem in its habitat niche, it has its needs met by its surrounding environment and the interactions within that environment. And so I ask human beings, what does that look like for us? How do we embody our habitat niche in the ecology where our needs are met by the other elements that surround us and the interactions and relationships between them and in our own activities and deriving what we need uh, are we able to also improve that environment that's providing for us? Because that's exactly what happens with wild grazing animals. They create the pasture. They garden the landscape to provide better and more diverse conditions for future generations. So, you know, that's one example. There's plenty of different uh, examples in ecology where a species just going on its merry way, eating and defecating, is planting and fertilizing and pruning and doing all these things seemingly without thought. Um, and so I ask, again, many of my students, I ask, what does it look like to design a, a habitat for human beings? How do we design our niche? That... I think that is the ultimate question of our time, mm. is it not? How, yeah. how do we design? <laughs> how do we design a, a way that we can live yeah. where we're not taking from one another, mm. we're not endangering the ecosystems which sustain us? So you you mentioned a number of important things, that, and I want to go back to those sure. things. I want to go back to the design idea. I want to go back to nature's animals. Mm working from this pr principle of making things better and how can we make things better before we do all of that i want to ask you how does this compare to how we live today i mean think about the average person living in a large city in the united states take any city chicago new york boston philadelphia houston mm -hmm. okay you know we are all once you get into a certain phase of life you're kind of in this machine you wake up, get your kids ready for school, they're off to school, they're going to consume something from a box, a bag, a carton, a tube for breakfast, maybe lunch. You're racing during your work day, you're right. hustling, 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 
gosh, you got to make the money to pay the rent to get the thing. It's mm -hmm. like you're constantly on the, the gerbil treadmill, right? As I, as I like to say. And, and then you get your kids home finally, shove some junk food in them, get them in front of the TV right. so you can have a minute to yourself and yeah. try and let your brain drain from the incredible <laughs> amount of onslaught of information and, and probably a lot of it being not what you would have designed right. if you could have designed it from scratch. Yeah. How does what you're talking about on a very real level mm -hmm. compare to what so many Americans are experiencing on the day-to-day? -day? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's essentially we're talking about opposite ends of a spectrum. But the, the thing that does relate is that what you just described is a pattern. It's a, an observable pattern behavior in a species. You just identified the common behavioral pattern of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at is, is these patterns, how do we take that series of experiences that has X amount of carbon output or waste or, you know, the inputs and outputs, you do an energy audit on that. And it's, it's a very wasteful, consumptive lifestyle that doesn't really leave much in the way of the enjoyment factor, too, which you kind of have to design for that, too, in this world. Um, so, we're, I mean, if you do an energy audit on that whole process just in a day, is the amount of energy created through whatever that person's doing for work or throughout um, their day of, of obtaining a yield, however they are, are they creating more energy than they're using during that day? or during that year. And you often find they're using way more calories of energy from systems that are essentially irreplaceable, fossil fuel energy, to create short-term gains that are maybe calories in food that come from, again, fossil fuel uh, designed systems. So it's it's kind of a mess. And <laughs> well, it's a huge mess. And it's, it's not a good equation when you look at the energy in versus energy out. I mean, mm. it's the same with industrial ag. Mm. You know, we're looking at, in some cases, 10 units of energy for one single energy unit output from the system. It's subsidized by cheap energy. Yes. And Fossil fuels, we know, run the system. And, and, and I think to your point, all of this stuff, is based on an extract, consume, waste mentality. It's very yeah. linear. It's, it, that's the line, you know, mm -hmm. and this is what we were taught. Adam Smith said, economies have to run on greed. We must pursue growth <laughs> at all costs. Of course, there's three big fallacies, three big lies to his work. One of them is that resources are limitless. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is that we should design a different system. Tell me about that system. Tell me about how that system might look. Yeah. Well, first of all, we're going to design a system that runs on current sunlight energy. Great. You know, which is plentiful. Yes. <laughs> In fact, quite plentiful. Yeah. So um, solar, solar energy. Yeah. Energy from the sun, energy that's naturally fa falling every day. Right. And, and ideally, we're going to use biological services over technological services wherever possible. Mm. Because the embodied energy in planting a tree versus designing a system that can do what a tree can or designing some kind of um, human-created product, it's, it's obviously way easier to thumb an acorn in the ground than it is to create a solar panel, right? But an oak tree can figure out how to take carbon dioxide and photons and turn it into sugar, right? Which is calorie, it's energy. So we're using uh, biological systems that can essentially make products out of thin air and, and sunlight um, and then process that material into uh, very different yields, whether it's um, carbohydrates, proteins, oils, um, fuel wood, biofuels, livestock forage, all these things can come from one tree, even one species of tree in some cases. Uh, and many of the thriving uh, ancient communities that are still around today have figured out what that one or two or three tree species are, and they still take care of the same trees, you know, that were planted 600 years ago, and it just gets better.
Yeah. I, so, I, yeah. Not to interrupt you, but mm-hmm. you know what what you're saying, what it reminds me of is we've really designed our systems based on the normal understanding, not the not the high level understanding, but the sort of the low grade or the mid grade mm-hmm. understanding of the world. Yeah. And two, three, four, five decades ago, the most high tech understanding we had of the world was chemical. Mm-hmm. So we designed a post-World War II <clears throat> world all around chemistry. Chemistry in the soil, chemistry, oh my gosh, here we've got amazing plastics. Right. You know, we really have a couple of generations of people who are absolutely infatuated with plastics. Mm-hmm. I'm always amazed when I get something from a company that is run pretty much all the time by baby boomers. Right. And 99 times out of 100, it's covered in a layer of plastic. And you have to unwrap that plastic yeah. to get to your thing. Mm-hmm. It just it boggles the mind. Yeah. It's, it's chemistry, 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 without ever thinking of the end result. The biggest revolution of our times, the biggest revolution of our times, I assert, is people like you who are teaching young people that the next world of understanding is biology. Mm. Far more infinite, far greater, far less predictable, far less controllable, but the benefits of the biological mechanisms are just as infinite, right? Mm. So that's why, that's why it's so exciting to hear this kind of talk when you say, what can a tree do versus what a solar panel? I, I love solar panels. Sure. We, we have solar panels. Sure. But if I could design a tree, now that would be something. Right. Yeah, I can't build a solar panel, but I can plant a tree, you know, so... Um, and, and I'm not negating the value of renewable energy technology. Sure. Yeah. There's no question that that has to be integrated. Um, but wherever possible, if we can use biology rather than sort of the green tech fix, we'll go for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to that linear pattern that you were describing as the, the common sort of narrative for, for people today, what we're doing is, is taking that straight line pattern and creating a circle. We're figuring out how our interactions and our relationships, the way we invest our money, our time, our interest, we figure out how that comes back around. Mm -hmm. It can mature and come back around, sort of like a ripening phase on anything, Um, rather than kind of just throwing energy everywhere to achieve something that may be there at the end of the line, but we don't know. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's a pattern of a runaway train. What we're seeing right now is the runaway train of agriculture. This is like a 10 or 12,000 year long process for our species of going from foraging peoples and horticultural societies to into these agrarian societies that just got bigger and bigger and bigger and more complex. And we turned our minds to technology and created a lot of really amazing things. To what end, I don't know. I mean, we can see the end game of agriculture in the most degraded places on the planet, you know, central China and the Middle East and, you know. Sure. Fertile Crescent. Right. That's, that's where we began. I, you know, welcome to the Fertile Crescent, ladies and gentlemen. It used yeah. to be a lush river basin filled with reeds and wonderful creatures, ecosystemic services going every which direction. It is now the otherwise known as Iran, Iraq, part of Turkey. These are sandy, rocky, dry, hard places. Yes. That's what we've done. That is the end of the experiment. We've got some great questions coming in. I, have, I definitely want to hit on, before we leave, sir. I want to hit on how can average people get engaged in permaculture, especially growing their own food. Yeah. I think that's really something that we need to hit on. And uh, yeah, that's an important thing. Here's a, here's a great question coming in. We want to hear, somebody's wanting to hear, Wesley Rowe wants to hear about the water harvesting. Mm. How are you working with water harvesting here yeah. in Ojai? Cool. Well, it's good to hear from she Wesley. Loved, yeah, she loved the video you shared. All right. So there you go. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, water harvesting is at the heart of, of this sort of biological design or ecological design because, as we know, everything is mostly water. We are mostly water. Um, this biosphere is mostly water. The reason why we're here is because of that. Mm. So that is the foundation of design. 
so what what I'm doing often now is answering calls from people who want to figure out how to prevent rainfall from leaving their landscape as quick as possible. Um, that's been the standard narrative. It's that runaway train straight line pattern of take this really amazing gift of complex hydrology and biological interface, which is, you know, the water cycle, and get rid of it as fast as possible. And so in a region like California, yeah, we we figure out how to slow spread, sink, saturate, and share water. You know, this yes. this is the narrative that sort of Brock Dolman and, and others uh, pioneered, and um, especially in California. And uh, we're looking at these strategies to retain that water and mimic the way that natural ecosystems that were once here would have dispersed rainfall and allowed it to sink into the soil slowly. Where, where's the best place to store water? In a dry environment, and, yeah. and so much of the world is. We now hear, you know, there was a big study that just came out recently that said 33%, 33% of what we had just 40 years ago in terms of arable land mm. on the world, on planet Earth, 33% is gone. Yeah. It's turned to desert. We've man-made, reversed, terraformed it into desert. <laughs> Not a good thing, right? Yeah. So how do we begin to address that problem? Because we're, we're like that in Ojai, California. We're an agricultural area, very dry, and it seems like our activities, man's activities, are making it drier here. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, the best place to store water is in the soil mm. and at the highest point possible, or really where it falls. You want to keep it where it lands in the soil. for as long as possible. In yes. the soil. Yeah. So so not an answer most people would think of. <laughs> You'd think of a pool or put it in a jug. Yeah. Put it in the soil. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what kind of water. Drinking water, yes. You store it in something where it's potable drinking water. Mm. But the majority of water yes. needs to be held in the soil available for biological activity, for trees, roots, and for all these organisms to utilize it and create oxygen and many ecosystem services. So yeah, where the rain falls is where it should kind of stay yes. while it slowly moves through the soil horizon down into the water table and then into the rivers and streams. So, so. you want to keep it in the ecosystem where it falls. Yeah. And I want you to say a little bit more about that and then I want to talk about food. Sure. The ecosystem where it falls mostly in Southern California, in the Central Valley and places, big agricultural places like that, yeah. we have dry, hard, compacted soils. So most people don't spend a lot of time doing this, but if you watch the rain fall, yeah. most of the time, it just runs off the surface. Yeah. How do you deal with that? As a permaculturalist, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, um, we'd often think that the Central Valley's flat, but it's, it's not. There's no such thing as flat land. It always has some slope. Mm -hmm. And so we work with the natural contours of the landscape to figure out the level lines, sort of like the squiggly lines on a topographic map mm. for, for most people, that's the way to relate to it. Um, what those are, are lines in the landscape where you can build uh, obstructions for water flow, whether it's a berm, whether it's a basin, um, whether it's a planting along that line. And that's always perpendicular to water flow. So mm. we want to stop water and spread it over a level surface so that it completely pacifies and it has nowhere to go other than down unless it reaches full capacity and then we put it through a spillway that's totally passive into the next part of the landscape. So we want to build dikes or dams kind of on the land. It's, it's all context-based. It mm -hmm. all depends on where. And sometimes it's just as simple as vegetating the landscape mm -hmm. or mulching it mm -hmm. because plants are the best at intercepting rainfall and getting it into the ground. Yes. But a lot of times there aren't plants there and you kind of have to fix things a bit to get that to catalyze. So... So you're looking to reinvigorate natural systems. Exactly. Yes. Ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in California, we do a lot of work to get rid of natural systems. Sure. In Ojai, for instance, one of our big natural systems that we're against, it's a bad plant. You know, remember I talked about this oh, yeah. issue, issue of ethics versus morality. Morally, we think Arundo is a bad plant. Yeah. It's an invasive species, like humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean... That's arguable. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but a lot of people work very hard to get rid of that. What do you do with a plant that you know is doing some good, but maybe there's too much of it or people don't like it? Yeah, well, that's a complex topic. And I think, 
you know, with any species that humans have placed a value on, once we create an economic value, which is a decided thing, we, we analyze it and say, okay, we can figure out a way to use this and monetize it, then we're exceptionally good at eradicating species. You know, I mean, this is the, the sixth mass extinction, so to speak. The Anthropocene is, you know, we're losing species all the time because of our actions. Yeah, welcome to the party, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Whoa. Where there is one thing that, that most, you know, humans are good at, and that's getting rid of species. So mm. I think that if we focus on Arundo and say, well, we need to at least manage it. Yes. Um, there's so many different yields and functions that it has naturally, and I don't, I can't even get into all of those right now. But um, I think we have to kind of set our sights on it as a resource rather than a problem. Mm. And also understand its virtues. You know, it's often said in permaculture, the problem is the solution. And it's really a shift in perception. If, if we look at a rundo, we say, oh, it's invasive, it's stealing water, it's choking out the watershed. What the problem is, is the state of the watershed. It's the erosion, it's, it's the pollutants in the water. And the Arundo is there to hold a place that was created. It's a disturbance niche created by humans where they clear cut the riparian forest, where they allow stormwater to go into the watershed like this mm. and erode a gully. And the only thing that's going to survive is Arundo and it's going to get in there aggressively and line the banks and hold it together and take the nitrates out and the arsenic and the cadmium and the lead and all these things that we put into the watershed. So it's actually performing functions. It's not the problem. The problem is us and our management of the landscape. So it's seeing that rather than targeting a single species and then, you know, inevitably poisoning ourselves with the things that we apply to that, like glyphosate. Yeah, of course, because yeah. then we go in and we spray Roundup, which is glyphosate, this this chemical that has been linked very clearly to cancer. Yeah. Uh, we spray that all over California, trying to get rid of this plant that is trying, as you said, to fill a hole, a void in the ecosystem. Trying to, it's trying to help manage that those problems that we've created. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, it's it's a very controversial thing, but invasion biology. If you dig a little deeper. We kind of realized that there's some ties to the biotech industry and sales of herbicides. Yeah, well, so it's look manufactured who makes money. Inf information. <laughs> right. So yeah. you know, if this plant is bad, we've got to we've got to go on the war path. You know, exactly. it's a it's a Vietnam level sort of spraying spree exactly. yeah. is what we're doing. Yeah, and of course, people off. yeah, people made good money on on war for a long time. Sure. Uh, many of those companies are still in business, and as you, as anybody in business knows, when you have a company, you've got to keep making money. Hmm. So let's find new things to bomb. Arundo, perhaps not the problem. Perhaps it's somewhere in the gray matter between our ears. Connor, what else? What else can we do to grow our food? A lot of people don't have big yards. They may live in apartments. How can they participate? I think growing food provides a level of security and independence. It's great for children getting that connection begins to ask bigger questions about our society. How can we, from a permaculture perspective, as a society, take some baby steps in this direction? Yeah, well, I think it all starts with water and soil. So if we can figure out by assessing where we live, whether it's a suburban lot or an urban environment or broad acre, whatever it is, mm. we figure out, first of all, how much energy we have within ourselves to commit to things. If you've got some time and you want to start gardening, then start saving your food scraps, start composting, start building your soil, figure out how you can take a little rainwater and center it in the area where you want to plant, hydrate your soil, and then figure out the right garden bed technique for your region. In this climate, actually sinking it a little bit below grade is better, so it traps moisture. In wetter climates, you want to elevate it. That's why the raised bed is common. Um, and then also identify uh, what fruit and nut tree species are going to work well in your region. So this is all context-based. And start planting perennials and vegetables in a manageable way. You know, if you're in a in an apartment, you could have some kind of container gardening set up. And you could be doing, you know, tomatoes and, and herbs. And at least you're making a start. And the important thing is you're developing a relationship with your food and, and a relationship with ecology even if it's domesticated plants in a pot on your porch, you're still 
beginning to fulfill that little part of ourselves that's actually quite a large part of ourselves that has to interact with ecology to feel healthy and well. Mm. Maybe that's my opinion, but I do think that ecology evolved us to this point and we kind of owe it to ecology to interact a little bit. So well, on what other... Absolutely. I mean, yeah. look, look, even people in New York, you go to Central Park mm. and you see the, the look on their face as they're walking in the cement urban jungle and there they are in the streets and it's competitive and it's timed and it's it's high pressure yeah and you go to central park and it literally you can see the change in people's faces when they approach that greenery and they get inside of it and they can breathe the oxygen that's coming yeah. off of those trees it's it's palpable yeah i feel it right now i'm smiling when you say that yeah yeah <laughs> and and so yeah you know it is about getting our hands in the dirt sure. to some degree, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, it's you know, having relationships with things other than human beings, mm. you know, seeing that there's a world of ecology outside of just us. And, and ultimately, that's what permaculture is, is yeah. creating beneficial relationships between human beings and the ecology that sustains us. And so whatever scale, large or small, figure out what you like to eat, what's easy to grow in your region and compost your food scraps, start taking food waste. I mean, there's so much waste in this supply chain that we have. Start composting other people's waste, too, if they don't want to do it. I mean, I've, we've been doing that for years at my farm in Ojai on the East End here, and, um, you know, 12 tons or more a year. We bring it in. It's a constant, constant input, um, which in urban, suburban environments, it's really easy to do. You walk down the street to a restaurant, and they're throwing it in the dumpster, you bring it home and feed it to your worms, right? Now you're talking. Yeah. That's good recycling. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah. you can do that on any scale, um, whatever's appropriate. That's kind of the thing. It's all mm. context-based. Mm. What, whatever you have the energy for, the space for, it's, it's incremental steps, small, slow solutions forward. You don't mm. want to overwhelm yourself. So, um, yeah. And then also get get a little bit more experience and education on plant ID because there's a lot of things, especially in California, in this region, there's there's a lot of edible plants and tree crops everywhere. I thought you were going to say there are a lot of edibles everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is also true in California, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> it's spreading across the country. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, you know, <laughs> learning to identify the the gifts of nature yeah. that can nourish our bodies. Brilliant. Yeah. Connor... You know, I, I, how could people get more of you? Because mm -hmm. we're getting comments. We're getting comments, everything from Man Crush Thursday. Okay, you're doing something right there, you know. Uh, to, to you are blowing people's minds and they want, they want more. I had no idea. Very cool, people are saying. <laughs> so they want more of you. Yeah. How can our listeners, how can our viewers get in touch with you, get more of what you're saying? Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Ojai Permaculture is my Instagram, and then also ohipermaculture.com is my website. I'll be running workshops again in the spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, we took a little break um, from that, and also starting up in the spring, we'll be running tours of our demonstration site, East End Eden, uh, on the east end of the Ojai Valley. So stay tuned to the website and Instagram for updates. Um, and after this winter, we'll be, we'll be going again with a lot of opportunities for people to, to come and see and learn. Great. Yeah. Great, Connor. So, ohipermaculture.com. Yes. That's the website, ohipermaculture.com. People can find you on Instagram mm -hmm. at ohipermaculture. And ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't been to Ojai and you want to meet Connor Jones, you want to take one of his workshops, come to our beautiful town, spend a weekend. It's a, it's a wonderful place to connect with nature, beautiful hiking trails, beautiful out of the cityness, mm -hmm. connecting with those trees. And you're going to love this gentleman. You cannot get enough of Connor Jones and neither can I thank you, Connor, for being on the show. Phenomenal, phenomenal to just, just spend a little time with you. Will you come back on and, and teach us some more stuff? Absolutely. It's in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks again. <laughs> right. Thanks for Thanks coming so on. Much, Ladies and gentlemen, Connor Jones, oh, hi, permaculture.com. You can get more information about Connor there. Our next guest, who will be with us in just a minute, is farming in the ocean. Can you believe it? Now, I'm not talking about fish and stuff like that, although that's part of it. 
he is actually doing a three-dimensional farm, a 3D farm on many acres of ocean and growing food, ladies and gentlemen, growing food. So that's what we're going to do next. I want to put a plug in for the Kiss the Ground book. We are very close to book launch. November 14th is coming right up. And if you haven't pre-ordered your copy of Kiss the Ground, now is the time to do it. Kiss the Ground book. Dot com. Don't forget to don't forget to have a look at that website, kissthegroundbook.com. There is a free one hour seminar that you get when you order the book. Free one hour seminar. And that is taught by me, but it's from information that I gathered over the course of ten years. This is the book that teaches you how to reverse climate change through diet, through agriculture, through incredible things like that. So don't forget, get your copy. Kiss the Ground Book, kissthegroundbook.com. Now, I've teased you. We've told you over Facebook. We've told you on the Internet that you are going to hear about permaculture in the oceans. Radical concept. But think about it. Three-quarters of the planet is covered by water. Three-quarters of our blue planet, which is blue from space. Why? Water. This is the untapped resource, and it's really become, unfortunately, the dumping ground of our society, becoming acidic because of so much carbon dioxide that's being absorbed, becoming anoxic, meaning without oxygen, because of the tremendous amounts of ammonium nitrate that comes off of our farm field. We are hurting our oceans, but could, could we grow food and help our oceans all at the same time? Could we use the power of nature to grow food in our aquatic environments? Here to answer that question today is my next guest, Dan. Dan, Dan, thank you for being on the show with us. It's a pleasure. You've come today from Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, California. Long drive. <laughs> Not too long. Right? Not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. Dan, before we get into what you do, which is pretty incredible, tell me your story. How did you start? How did you become an ocean farmer? How did this happen? Um, well, it's pretty crazy, actually. Um, <laughs> it's basically due to my amazing little wife. Okay. Um, Antoinette and I uh, started walking on the beach about five years ago. She was, um, came from Bakersfield. Oh, and, my gosh. And Bakersfield has no beach, right? No, she's it's always hot. had a huge love of the ocean. Right. So did you put an ad in a single... Did you say, <laughs> like long walks on the beach? Because I truly think that is the most effective, still to this day, maybe I'm dating myself, you know, ad on what, whether you're doing Match.com or Plenty of Fish, pay attention. Right, right. It worked for Dan. It right. could work for you. Right. So she... Uh, we met actually in a hardware store, which is kind of another funny story. But uh, wow. Anyways, okay. anyways, uh, it's all nuts and bolts, right? right? Exactly. Da -da -da -da. Uh, Watch out. Antoinette um, was really fascinated by kelp, kelp, and she started playing with it. Okay. And then she's such this crazy little researcher yes. that she started researching it, and and we just started talking with different people. Um, we made contact and met and actually hosted. Uh, Bren Smith from Green Wave. He came to our house for like three days back in 2015. Okay. You know, and we talked about all the different stuff that, you know, can go on. And then during this whole process of meeting everybody we possibly could meet, we met uh, with um, Sunny Seaside Farms in Santa Barbara. And again, to make a long story short, um, I went in and helped them clean up a place that they had on Kellogg. And then uh, for the, I was going to basically rent a place to use it for growing uh, the babies before we took them out to the, to the um, to lease. Um, the one of the owners um, showed up. He owned like a six percent of it, I guess, and he didn't want to rent, so they had to sell it. So the uh, the owner that we were dealing with felt really bad, so she gave us the twenty five acre lease. As kind of like the sweat equity I did for uh, cleaning up the property and getting it all ready to to be used again because it was in a very bad condition. Okay, so so let me get this straight. <laughs> you 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 like long walks on the beach. Love them. You met your wife in a hardware store. I did. You went to clean up a property. Yep. A physical, just like on the land, somebody's property. Yes. yes. 
and they couldn't remunerate you for that experience. So they gave you 25 acres, not of ocean front, <laughs> but of ocean. Is 20, this true? A 25 acre ocean lease to ocean fish lease. and wildlife. Now, what, you know, when I look in the classifieds for property, <laughs> and we're speaking with Dan Marquez, by the way, Dan is, a, you know, I, I, what is your title? Are you an ocean farmer? Is that what you are? I like to call myself a restorative ocean farmer. A restorative ocean farmer. Yes. So it's, you know, we just had Connor Jones on talking about permaculture. He was great, by the y way. Yeah, we're kind of talking about permaculture for the oceans, are we not? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, okay. So Dan Marquez, a restorative ocean farmer performing permaculture in the oceans. Now, you have a 25-acre lease, not of oceanfront, but of ocean. Yes. The last time I checked the classifieds, when I was looking at property <laughs> values... I didn't see any ocean for sale. <laughs> How do you get an, a lease of ocean? How does one do such a thing? You have to go through Fish and Wildlife. Currently in the state of California, there are 17 bottom water leases in the state. Um, mine's the only one that's going to be uh, set up for growing kelp. The other 16 are for mussels and oysters. Got it. Okay. So, so, and, so there is a precedent for leasing a bit of ocean. Yes, this lease actually is one of the oldest kelp farms in the United States. It started in 1979 by Dr. Michael Nuschel. Wow, that's yes. amazing. And it's right here in, in basically Goleta, California, I like to call it because I'm a Goleta hick myself. Okay. Okay, and it's right there by the Elwood Pier in Goleta, if, if anybody's familiar with that area. Okay, okay, and for those of people who are not familiar with Goleta, just a tad north of Santa Barbara. It's near the Santa Barbara. You've all seen yep. Santa Barbara in the movies, okay? And what makes Goleta famous? Isn't there a certain festival? They have a... Um, yeah, the Lemon Festival. The Lemon Festival. Yes. So, so we're talking about an agricultural area here, oh, yes. ladies and gentlemen. Very oh, agriculture. Yes. But when you tell people that you're a kelp farmer, <laughs> what do they say? It's a great way to start a conversation, actually, because they, the first thing you say is, what? Yeah. You're, you're a what? Yeah. You know, so... Uh, it's been very entertaining as far as um, introducing myself that way, that's for sure. Right. And, of course, they get very curious. And a lot of people don't know just how incredible kelp is. Or, to be specific, it's algae. Yes. Because there's only specific types of kelp, there's only specific types of seaweed, but algae covers it all. Right. And okay. these are, when we talk about seaweeds, we're really talking about macro algae, aren't we? Yes. So, so when you think about, ladies and gentlemen, algae... We're thinking about stuff that grows in a pond or, you know, often the green slime right. kind of algae, right? Right. This algae is the kind of stuff you might trip on right. if you're running on a beach that yes. hasn't been cleared. And so right. many of our beaches are manicured, i.e. the great famous Santa Monica Beach. If you go out it, there at well, 4 or 5 in the Santa morning, Barbara also. Right? Yes. What, what's out there? Big sand machines, yes. right? So without those machines, stuff washes up on the beach. A lot of it is is seaweed, which right. is macroalgae. So you grow this. How much kelp do you grow in 25 acres? Well, we're not growing yet, unfortunately. We're still going through the permitting process. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Okay, so yes. this is a long process oh, to get permission yes. to grow kelp. Yes. But even though it's an established crop in that yeah, well, the, scenario. The, yeah, well, unfortunately, because once we changed from neutral mariculture to pharmacy, which is we are, um, the whole thing kind of changes with that. So I have to go and get certified through or permitted through Coastal Commission, Army Corps of Engineers, believe it or not, mm. because apparently they are in charge of the surface and bottom of the ocean for miles out. And also the Quality Water Board. Now, if I went into uh, kelp for food, yes, then I start... Uh, getting a bunch more permits uh, right more, now. More, even more permits. Oh my gosh! You've got to get the army and the uh, navy and the, <laughs> the NASA's got to be right. involved. It's pretty crazy. So okay. Hog Island oyster, which are up north, um, above San Francisco, mm. great outfit. Mm. I was talking to their manager. Seventeen permits is what they have. Got it. Seventeen. Okay. So ocean farming, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to divest of your stocks and put it into ocean farming tomorrow because it seems like this is a nascent industry. But but what's the potential? So let's say you get through this permitting process. Right. You've obviously studied this. You've oh, got gosh, a lot yes. of background. You've got yes. a lot of science on this. This is not something you're doing on a whim. What, what What's possible? 
What, what's possible in your little plot? What's possible if we start 3D farming right. in the oceans? Can we make the oceans better? Can we grow food? What can we do, Dan? Well, the, the other thing that's so incredible about kelp is the sequestration of carbon. You know, we're looking at something that, that kelp sequesters five times more carbon than any land-based plant or tree. Again, and again, like you said well, in the beginning, five this, times more. Five carbon. times more. So kelp sequesters five times more carbon. Yes. Than anything, even a tree. Even a tree. That is some very dense carbon. It's amazing what this stuff does. Now, is that just in the floating portion, or does you know? Forgive my lack of knowledge. But does kelp have roots? How does it work? Yeah, it has a holdfast system, it's called. So the holdfast system will attach to rocks or some kind of hard surface and then grow from there. Okay. You know, and depending on on uh, the species, you're looking at, you know, either single stipe or multiple stipes coming off of that and then all the different blades also. Mm. And macrocystis, which is giant kelp, is one of the only kelp that has like a floating device on it. You know, so yeah. it's an incredible kelp. But... Um, getting back to what it can do for the oceans. Yes. Okay. Um, there was a survey done, and I and I love it. I got to steal this line from my friend Tim O'Shea, when he says that you know we are and we are all islanders on this planet ocean. Ah. Okay. We're all islanders, which I just love that. You know, I thought that was you know hysterical, and I, I thought it was a great description of the planet and you know how we actually fit in with the planet. Yes. Well, it's true because we forget. That land is the minority of our planet, yes, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So we say kiss the ground. We should also say, you know, and hug the oceans <laughs> or well, something, right? Every other breath we take comes from the ocean. Yeah. From the oxygen that is made from the, the ocean. So, you know, it is something that we need to protect. It's something that we need to help in mm. any way we can. Yes. And there was a survey done, getting back to what I said, if we farmed 9% of the world's oceans, which is equivalent to Australia times three, we would sequester 54 gigatons of carbon. We would stop the acidification problem of the ocean. We could feed the world. We can um, get off about 40% of the fossil fuel that we're now using. You know, I mean, it's just endless. And then the, the, the fish industry and the fish fin uh, industry would come back also because um, macrocystis is, and most kelps, are amazing ecosystems for the fishery system. Excuse me. Wait. I'm, I'm sorry, Dan. I'm going to go grab my flippers and my oxygen <laughs> tank. I, I've got to start doing this right now. That is incredible that, that we could have such a vast impact. Now, I think a lot of people would hear about ocean farming and they say, oh, no, don't want to hurt the oceans. You know, right. I, I don't want to disturb the biology that's right. happening. We know it's a delicate ecosystem. Right. It's it just somehow we know that, you right. know, without even doing any studies. How do you address those concerns? How do you mitigate damage? maximize responsibility, and really help restore all of these things that you're talking about? Um, I think it's going to, a lot of it's going to uh, be through research. Um, one of the things that we want to do on our farm is grow macrocystis from the bottom up, uh, not having a long line system. They do a long line system for macrocystis in Chile. But, I mean, that's like instant satisfaction or instant gratification type, right? They grow it for three months. They come and harvest it all off the line. And it's done, and you're left with empty ropes again in the water. Um, by growing it from the bottom up, you know, you're looking at a plant that will live four to five years that in good water condition and nutrient levels grows one to three feet a day. Wow. A day. That's a serious growth. Yeah, it's crazy. I, it's absolutely crazy. I don't know anyone else who can <laughs> claim to grow that much of anything in a day. Yeah, the, the only thing I can think of is, to me, what a cousin on land is bamboo. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so a fast growing. So are you harvesting the whole plant no. each day or are you just kind no, of that's, pruning it? That's the beauty of, of uh, growing macrocystis is that we're basically going to give it a haircut. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. it's going to keep on growing. Yes. It's going to keep on sequestering carbon. It's going to keep on providing this amazing ecosystem. And all we're doing is come over and clipping a little bit off the top. Wow. You know, because wow. we don't need much for what we're doing with it. This is amazing. So you can, you know, and I'm hoping we get a couple more interesting questions from our, from our live community because this is fascinating, really. The potential to grow, and I've been out to Catalina, mm -hmm. seen, you know, those of you who are listening, imagine a kelp forest, this beautiful, 
vertical forest growing in the water, and you're swimming through these long tendrils of, of all sorts of different colors. The sun is shining through. It is an ecosystemic explosion of life. It's incredible. Fish, yes. turtles, strange little floaty creatures of all <laughs> shapes and sizes. It's like, it is like planting a forest in the sea, isn't it, Dan? It is. And that's what one of our goals is, is we're going to be creating an ecosystem. Okay? So we're going to see everything come back to the area. You know, the, the, you know it's going to attract little tiny fish, which is going to attract a little bigger fish, bigger and bigger and bigger fish. You know, so the fishermen are going to want to love to, far, to fish the outskirts of the farm mm. because it's going to be so vibrant with life. Yeah. And it's very exciting. And we're going to have to try to figure ways. I mean, there's, you know, people ask me about like the sea urchins, you know, and I'm like, well, hopefully they come, you know, and we can hire, you know, local divers to collect the sea urchin because that's a great market for them. Right. You know, and because the other thing that I'm, you know, of course, my wife's a huge fan of these also is the sea otter. Yes. Now, oh, my gosh. What an issue, too. I, I had no way. I, we recently took a trip to the Monterey Aquarium. I oh. recommend everyone. I li literally, I think this is a, a world destination, a lifetime destination. You know, right. it, it, it literally will bring you to tears by the beauty oh, that amazing. you get to experience in yes. this aquarium. But yes. one of the displays that really caught my daughter's attention <laughs> first, because she wanted to know right. all about the otter, and then I started reading... I was heartbroken yes. to realize how few of these beautiful creatures we have left yes. and that people have killed them for sport. How do we bring them back? Can, can this process that you're doing help bring back the sea otter? I hope so. I really do. I really do hope so. Um, one of the things that the kelp forest, um, there was a, and I'm sure you probably know this, and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to get it correct. There was a video about how a wolf changed the course of a river. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, a whole ecosystem. One yes. wolf. Yes. You know the the keystone species, as we call them. Yes. When they're missing, the entire ecosystem begins to unravel. Right. When you bring them back, you can begin to rebuild an ecosystem through ecological memory. It's Correct. A, it's a concept we discuss in Kiss the Ground, the book. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So the otter is the wolf of the kelp forest. Ah. Okay. The otter is the one that used to maintain the balance eating urchins and eating certain stuff and keeping the balance of the cow forest. I see. Okay. Okay. So, yes. you know, and for the time being, we're going to have to do that job. Right. You know, until the otter population can, can come back. Right. But and, you could set up some controlled forests. Oh. And, you know, the Monterey Aquarium, I yes. know these people are very committed to conservation. So yes. there is potent, great potential oh, here yes. to rebuild the food system. Yes. That is critical for the otter. Yes. Which in turn is bizarrely critical to carbon sequestration. Yes. So uh, here we have uh, a, you know, yes. these species that we didn't realize are so critical to our climate, actually. Yes. Yes. Because the, the healthy kelp forest is going to sequester carbon. Right. You know, so, right. you know, right now, um, the ocean's getting out of whack. Yes. You know, the, the, the amount of CO2 in the water forming carbonic acid and which is the acidification process that's going on at the ocean. And... You know, we need to grow kelp. Another thing that's, you know, that they talk about, too, especially here in, in Ventura County and Santa Barbara County, we've uh, uh, all kind of uh, come across, is these red tides. Mm, okay. Yes, the dreaded red so tide. So it's demoic acids. Mm. Okay, so it's just a quote-unquote bad algae. Mm. Now, this algae, the, the, one of the things that, you know, that I've been talking with different scientists about is that if there is no competition for that food source— then it's like a bad weed in your garden, right? Right. It just takes off. Yes. Well, the same thing is going on with this demoic acid, this right. bad algae. Yes. Okay, so if we grow kelp, which eats the same stuff as this demoic, uh, the bad algae does, because mm. it's always been there. You know, it, it didn't just show up out of nowhere. Yes. It's always been there. This bad algae has always been in the water, quote, unquote, bad algae. It's always yes. been in the water. Mm. But it's always been kept under control because there was a healthy, thriving, good algae mm. that eats the same diet but now there's not right an ecosystem out of balance will always self-correct yes we as humans may not like the way it self-corrects 
Right. It's better to work with the natural systems to try and balance them, which is, sounds Agreed. like what you're trying to do with the kelp forests. We are. You yeah. know, the, the, the other exciting thing about the farm is that we're going to be working with different universities. Um, you know, we're working with the Bren School, um, uh, Dr. Mike Graham up at the Moss Landing uh, Marine Laboratory. He's an amazing guy. The whole phycology uh, uh, group, I guess, or, you know, in the whole country, basically, is a very small group of people that all know each other. So Mike's really fast is really interested in getting me introduced to his friend Matt who's at San Diego State. You know, so there's all sorts of research that we that we're gonna be wanting to doing together. Um, being able to use the farm for that. Mm. You know, Mike's yeah. graduate students are just you can't wait and No, it seems like an amazing student project. Oh my gosh. So so Dan, when do you think Based on the, all this crazy permitting, and you know, you've obviously seen these kelp forests in action. You've studied them. You know, Bren. Uh, help me with his last name. Smith. Bren Smith yes. is doing this yes. as well in New England. Yes. How long until you can be up and running? Do you think growing your 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 kelp forest on your twenty five acres? Right, and I, I think we're looking at about nine to ten months. Okay, so yes. we're close. Yeah. Well, yes. It's been a long journey. It's hasn't been it? a long journey. Yes. Right. Wow. Yeah. The the biggest problem in California right now is the agencies, not the agencies trying to be bad or evil, mm. is the agencies aren't funded correctly to do their job. Wait up, wait up. Government isn't funded <laughs> correctly. I, you know, no, shocking, it, right? It, it, one after another, my guests <laughs> shock me on the, on the inefficiency of government. You're, so, you're bursting my bubble, Dan. Right. So you have um, Fish and Wildlife. Yes. Has one guy, Randy, in charge of mariculture for the state of California. I don't want Randy's job. Okay. I'm already you, feeling for you Randy. You have Cassidy. Yes. Coastal Commission. The fact one that, guy. The fact that you know their names. Yes. And they're in they're charge. They're great guys. Yeah. They're, they're great people. I mean, yeah. they're not, again, like I said, they don't, they're trying to do good. Of course. You know, yeah. it's just, you know, because I don't think most people go to work to try to do bad anyways. Right. You know, so they're trying to do good, but they're just so limited by their resources. So, I mean, California, you know, and this is another thing that kind of annoys me is that, you know, we were supposed to be the lead in so many things and we used to be the lead in so much stuff. Right. Because we're not in this. Right. The East Coast is kicking our butt, mm. you know, and I because I've been back there. I've been on the farms. I mean, I've seen how the thing is set up. I actually yeah. built the largest kelp hatchery in the United States for Brent. Wow. I designed so and built you've this. You've built one of these already. You know it can work. Yes. This is not theoretical science. No, it's not. I mean, I've been on his farm. You know, I've seen the process. Yes. You know, it's exciting. In yeah. fact, in fact um, we just got some grant money through the university, through UCSB, the Brent School, we're going to be building a hatchery. Oh, great! Here in California. Okay, good. You know, yeah. And we're also working with some of the um, marine labs for the the, the science that we're going to need. Yes. You know, so it's getting exciting. This is cutting edge stuff. I mean, cutting edge thinking about our oceans as a place that we can heal, grow food from, grow. Actually, you know, I've read several studies that say giving seaweed to cows. Yes reduces methane emissions from cows. Now, this is all coming out of Australia, so it's initial stuff. Right. But, wow. There's a could species. We, could we not feed, Yes. create animal feed for this, oh, yes. too? Yes. This, this one species that's grown in the tropics, it's a red, actually reduces the emissions uh, from their burps is where they usually have the yes. most. Yes. By over 95%. I am thinking of personally eating more of them. <laughs> I need to reduce my personal emissions. I think, you know, this whole conversation has made me want a big seaweed salad. Dan, it's so exciting. I want to know, how can people out there, how can they help you? What can people do for you? Oh, man. Is um, it research that you need? Is it funding? Is it uh, help? Do you need volunteers? What do, what do you need to make this happen? Uh, eventually, we're going to need, as soon as we're able to get into the water mm. and start planning, I'm going to need some volunteers. Yes. You know, that'd be really, who'd be interested in this, who'd have to be scuba certified, you know. Um, Count me in. Right, right on. I, I'm, yep, a right Patty on. certified diver right here, right ready on. to go. Right on. Yep. Um, you know, we're, I have to be honest, I've never been good about asking for money. Yes. I, it's just not part of my, so I'm, we're just, my wife and I are just trying to go for this. We've had, we do have some people that are um, looking to be partners with us that are mm -hmm. amazing themselves. Yeah. Um, that we actually met here in Ojai. Great. Yay, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a good town for that. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, um, magical connections happen yes. in our little town. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, my wife has developed this amazing product 
from the a kelp that we currently wild harvest. Is it birth control? <laughs> <laughs> It's because that's what I, I think. The you know, if the world could just drink, right. you know, whoa, what a big conversation. Anyway, right. so um, she's developed a um, some skincare line. Oh, okay, that's okay. so you do put it on your body. I wasn't yes. that far off. No, you're okay. not that far off. Okay, good. You're not that far off at all. Yes, um, because I mean, the other thing that people don't seem to realize is kelp is the Superman of all superfoods. Oh yes, it has Absolutely. everything that we need in it. Good food, including yes. iodine, which you can't get from anywhere else. Very good. Okay, okay. Yeah. and. Our skin just happens to be the largest organ we have on our body. Yes. And you can actually um, absorb the nutrients from the kelp and through the stuff that we're using. Because so you, you, you can put it on your face. You can yes. put it on your skin. Oh, yes. well, she, you, you absorb the nutrients through dermat, dermatologically through yes. your skin, yes. through your dermis. As and the there's, case may and be. the process that she uses is the only process right now we use no chemicals at all Wow. to extract the properties from the kelp. Okay, so so it's a chemical-free skincare uh, line or skincare agent yes. that is going to be produced from your kelp that your wife developed. This is going to be, an, I can see this, you are going to be the king and queen of <laughs> California kelp. It's going to be awesome. You're open to investment in your company, in your venture? We are. For the right people. For the right people, For the exactly. Because, right yeah. you know, Bren... Also warned me, you know, when he started this whole thing, you know, yes. we, we had to make sure. I'm that, not offering. Bob, right, right. right. <laughs> is, Filmmaking has not been exceptionally <laughs> lucrative up to this point. <laughs> well, neither is kelp farming, to be but, honest well, with you. Well, we're in the same boat. Right. Yes. Um, you know, his biggest thing was just being careful about the people that come on. We don't want big industry. I mean, I guess, you know, the thing that I think that's really, really important is that right now mm. we're just going to start farming the oceans, right? Yeah. And we have a chance to do it. Right. Yes. And we want to do it right. Yes. And we don't want to follow large ag. Right. We don't want to. We don't want to repeat the mistakes no. we made on land no. in the water. We don't want to bring that thinking into our oceans. Right. It should stop. And now comes the permaculture. Now comes the regenerative, the regenerative mindset. Right. For our planet's beautiful blue oceans. So one of the things that we're doing is that since we're we're the only ones that are this close to being permitted, mm. so we're trying to be the guinea pig for the agencies to make it easier for other people to come in behind us to get permitted and something like that. Yes. Where they'll be able to use our resources, use our data, you know, to, to um, expedite their permitting process. And then the other the exciting thing is that I was contacted by a uh, California senator um, oh. in San Francisco. Okay. And they're looking to see what they could do legislative-wise to help with the agriculture industry. Great. So I'm going to meet... I'm going to have I have an agricultural meeting next week in Sacramento actually. Yes. With Fish and Wildlife. Good. And we're going to talk with Randy uh who's in who's in charge of agriculture for Fish and Wildlife and hopefully mm. Cassidy will be there mm. and find out okay guys what are your handcuffs? You know, what are your what keeps you from being more effective? Yes. And see if we could do something legislative wise. So, so you need help at the state level too. You really oh, do. Oh gosh, don't you? yes. Okay. Yes. Well, my hope is that people around you People who are listening to this can begin to put, you know, nice pressure, pressure right. nonetheless, but right. positive pressure yes. on our state legislature, yes. even at the level of governorship. You know, I know Gavin Newsom is going to run for governor of this state. He's lieutenant governor. He was mayor of San Francisco. I know that Gavin is very committed to environmental initiatives. So I would hope that he and his team take a strong look at this, because this could be could this not be economically beneficial for our state? Oh gosh, yes. We have a big coastline. Oh yes. We could we could yeah, really the, the amount of of biomass that can be created out there. Yeah. In a, a nice sustainable way, mm. you know, because I really don't want to see the big giant companies come in, but it'd be right. so awesome to see the small farmers come in and working even with the Indian nations. Also, I'm going to be meeting with some Indian groups also Great. that are really fascinated about this. Great. You know, and seeing ways to do this. Yeah. Um, but yes, California. Because this huge coast, mm. um, even the mussel growing alone could be incredible. And we're not talking about Venice Beach mussel, <laughs> not Schwarzenegger. <laughs> we're, we're talking about mussels from the ocean. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. yes. I like to eat those. Oh, they're great. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that there's a great relationship between the kelp and the mussels as it is. Uh, the mussels um, do a filtration of the ocean, but they also produce ammonia because mm. they go to the bathroom just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. But ammonia just happens to be food for kelp. Kelp. Love it. Dan Marquez, 
you know, we could probably talk for another three or four hours. <laughs> so love to have you back on. No problem. Love to get an update when you're a little further down oh, the yes. road. How can viewers, how can listeners engage with you? Do you have a website, an email? What is the best way for people to get in touch? Yeah, pharmacy.com. And, it, and it, you know, see the way it's kind of spelled a little different there. Farm a C. Farmer C. So, so P H A R M E R S E A. My wife came up with this, by the way. Dot com. Okay, good. So P H A R M E R S E A. Farmer C. Dot com. Yep. Great. So that's your website. Yes. Contact information Contact, on there. Yep. My email's okay. on there, which Fantastic. is actually just pharmacy at gmail.com. Okay. There you go. Great. And Dan, if you could ask our listeners, our viewers, one question, hypothetical, theoretical, real question, any question you want, what question would you ask them? Hmm. I guess, have they been out in the ocean lately? Great question. Have they seen it? Have they been around it? Have they felt it? You know, especially for people who've lived on the coast for a long time. I mean, I'm, I'm fourth generation Santa Barbara. Um, you know, I've been, I mean, I've dove these waters for over 30 years. Wow. The kelp forest, you know, in Santa Barbara it was so amazing when I was younger. Mm. And it just got hammered from um, El Nino, you know, temperature stuff, you know, all sorts of different things are going on. Right. Um, so... Yeah, I just I think everybody needs to just take a a little step and just take a peek at the ocean, go see the ocean. I mean the that euphoric feeling you get from walking along the beach, it's from the negative ions that are created by the waves. Mm. So it's really good for you. You know, breathing in that salt air is really good for you. And the older I get, the more I believe we actually crawled out of that big old blue sucker. A lot of people believe we did, <laughs> and when I get in there I feel right at home. So there must be some connection. Dan Marquez, thank you so much for being on The Big Picture Show. Thank you for doing what you do. I am so excited about your kelp farm, your kelp forest, your permaculture of the sea. Can't wait to see your, your, your pharmacy grow. Right. Thanks again for being thank on the show. Thank you so much. All right, this is episode four of The Big Picture Show. Thanks, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, for listening. More next week. Tune in Thursdays, and we'll have more permaculture, more sustainability, more regeneration. Thank you, and have a great week. Welcome to the Big Picture Show with your host, Josh Tickell. We are the new media, so don't forget to like and share this podcast.